who was one of Jesus' disciples, was incredibly unpredictable. He kept his mouth shut when he should have opened it, and he opened his mouth when he should have kept it shut. And this is partly why I love him, because he reminds me of me, and he reminds me of so many of you. He is the best of us, and he is the worst of us, all wrapped up into one person. And what's incredibly stunning is that he became Jesus' best friend. He became the lead disciple and eventually one of the most powerful evangelists in the church. And yet he would also be the one who would be martyred for his faith, some believe hung upside down on a cross, to die. And so what we're going to learn through Peter over these next three weeks is exactly what this entire summer series is meant to be about, and that is three things. This is God's story that we're living in. And secondly, God is the hero of this story. And yet he also invites us into the story, just like he did with Peter, just like he did with Enoch last week that Kelly talked about, and just like he does for us. And today we're going to look at a story about Peter that helps us understand how he learned these truths And a story, I believe, that is strangely appropriate for where we are as a community this morning. And the story is told in the 14th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, starting with verse 22. But in verses 1 through 21, we see these two stories happen first. First of all, John the Baptist, Jesus' predecessor and his cousin, is killed. And second of all, Jesus miraculously feeds the 5,000 with just a few loaves of bread and a few fish. And so there's a lot of conflicting stuff going on as we get to this story. There's this pain about losing John the Baptist, and there's this incredible power and miraculous stuff that Jesus is doing, the same stuff that Dave Bartlett always talks about to us, that we live lives between these two rails, the rails of pain and the rails of joy. Many of us are closer to the rail of pain this morning. But that's where we find the disciples and Peter and Jesus at the start of this story. And this is how it begins. Immediately, this means right after Jesus finished feeding the 5,000, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side, to the other side of the lake, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had dismissed them, he went up to the mountainside by himself to pray. And later that night, he was there alone, and the boat with the disciples in it, was already a considerable distance from the land. And it was buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. The disciples are in the middle of that lake because Jesus made them go on to the lake, as our text says. They are doing exactly what Jesus called them to do. And yet they are not spared the storm. And if any of you remember the teaching that Dave taught so powerfully just a few months ago during our Imperfect Family series, he said, when the storm hits, and it will hit all of us, my friends, none of us is exempt. When the storm hits, it does not mean that God has withdrawn his presence. It does not mean that you are not right where you are supposed to be. And when we are in the midst of it, when the wind is against us, as Matthew describes the disciples, when we are in the midst of being buffeted by pain and suffering, it is going to feel like we are all alone. We feel like Jesus did on the cross when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is a very, very human reaction. But the truth of the scriptures And the truth of this story is that sometimes for reasons we don't understand yet, God allows us to row our little boats right into the storm. And when that happens, don't be fooled. Don't fall for the lie that God does not go with us. The story continues. Shortly before dawn, so the poor disciples have been out there all night. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. And when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said. I love the disciples. And they cried out in fear. 
But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. And what Jesus said here is so incredibly powerful, but we miss it in the English translation. You see, what Jesus actually said was not, it is I, like some proper British dude. It is I, King James English man. That is not what he said. What he literally said is, take courage. I am. Don't be afraid. And if you know your Bible, you know that that is the name that God gave to himself when he met Moses at the burning bush and said, Moses, you go tell that Pharaoh to let my people go. And Moses said, okay, but who should I tell him sent me? And God said, you tell them that I am sent you. You see, Jesus was not just offering a casual hello to his friends, like, hey, boys, it's me. What Jesus was really here to say to his schizophrenic disciples, it's a ghost, What he was really saying to them was, I am God. And what he said to them in the midst of that storm, and what he says to his children today, what he says to you and to me in the midst of our storms is take courage. The great I am, the God of your fathers and mothers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is with you. So though the wind is howling and the waves are lashing at you, threatening to take you under, don't be afraid. So then Peter, as he almost always does, just takes it one step too far. Like my kids tell me I always do when we're joking around and I add the final punchline and my kids are like, Mom... You ruined it. (laughs) Why don't you just sit the next couple of plays out? (laughs) And Peter says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Now, an interesting thing about Jesus is that he performed miracles almost 100% of the time for the healing of or the good of another person. It was incredibly rare, if not non-existent, for Jesus to do miracles just to show off. But Peter didn't quite understand that. You see, he still had a hero complex. So the text continues. Then Peter got down out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him and said, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And we get so enamored in this section with the two and a half steps that Peter perhaps took on the water that we miss the real power of the moment. Immediately, Matthew tells us, Jesus responds when Peter yells out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. And I believe he speaks tenderly to him. He was his best friend. Jesus was right there immediately when Peter thought he was going to drown. And in the midst of the winds and the waves blowing against us today, if you hear nothing else I say this morning, hear this. God is closest to us in our suffering and our fear, whether we tangibly feel him or not. This is the deep message of the cross. Psalm 34, 18 said, God is close to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. And so when our hearts are broken and our spirits are crushed and we don't feel we have the strength to keep our head above the waters, Jesus reaches out his hand and he catches us. Peter had to learn this lesson. The story finishes. And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him Truly, you are the Son of God. And what I should preach right now is a sermon about Peter and his lack of faith. 
And how if he could just have kept his eyes on Jesus and not noticed the wind or the waves or the storm, he could have walked on water. I've heard that sermon a million times. And then the implication for me when I hear that sermon and the implication for you is that if you just had enough faith, you could walk on water too. If you could just keep your eyes on Jesus... When all around you the wind and the storms are raging or inside your own soul and mind the storms are raging, if you could just muster up enough faith when the wind turns against you, then maybe you could do the impossible. And if you're not doing the impossible, if you're not victorious in all circumstances, if your life is just ordinary, or if you're doubting or sinking in the water, the implication of that sermon is that it is your fault. Because you don't have enough faith. Or when bad things happen and tragedy strikes and we mourn and we rage and we grieve, we must not have enough faith. That is not the sermon I'm going to preach. Because when I look at Peter's life in all of the rest of the Gospels, I don't think that's why this story got told. Because over and over and over again in the life of Peter, what we read about in the scriptures are mostly about his failure. And over and over and over again, through that failure, Jesus is trying to teach Peter one thing. It's not about you. You're not the hero. I know you thought it would be cool to be a water walker, Peter, but this is God's story, and God is the hero. And Peter, Jesus says to him, the power in your life is going to come when it is perfected in your own weakness, in your own failure, and in your own final desperate understanding of how much you need my grace. You see, I believe Jesus invited Peter out of that boat that morning so that he could sink. Peter had to sink. And he had to sink so that he could start to learn that following Jesus is not about the big show. It's not about being the big shot. And the only way he could learn this was to step out of that boat and sink. Because what if he had succeeded? Have you ever thought about that? What if Peter would have walked on the water? And then all the times those disciples argued amongst themselves, who do you think is the greatest of all of us? Everyone would have said, well, Peter is, because he walked on the water. And then what? And then I am confident that Peter would not have become the leader of the church. Because what Peter had to learn here is what every single one of us have to learn, that following Jesus is not primarily about what I can do for him out of all of my own mustered up strength. Following Jesus is all about all the amazing things that Jesus has already done and will continue to do for me for all of eternity. Peter had to sink. And we have to sink too. We have to sink so that Jesus can grab us and save us and teach us that same lesson. It is not about you or your power or your ability or your strength. Jesus wants us to know it is all about me, he says. It's about my power, my ability, my strength exercised on your behalf. And what I'm asking from you is for you to have faith in me, Jesus says, not in your own self. See, the message Peter had to bring the world, the message that Peter gave that brought thousands of people to Christ was not, look at me, I can walk on the water. The message that Peter needed to bring to the world and the message that God wants you and me to bring to the world isn't, look at us, we can walk on water. The message that we are called to bring and that Peter was called to bring is, don't look at me, I sink, but look at him He always rescues, he always saves, he's always present in the storm, and he is the one you must look at, not me. This is how God works. This is how God worked through Peter, and this is why God let him sink, and this is why Jesus lets us sink, so we can finally get this. That it is through our weakness 
It is through our broken places. It is through the cracks in our lives that God's power and light and goodness shine. As Paul writes, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. When will we get that? When will I get that? And so I just want to ask you this question to think about this morning. In what part of your life Have you been told, or do you feel, or do you still believe that if I just had more faith, I could walk on the water? Where are you still in your life holding on to this idea that it is all up to you, that if you could just muster up more faith, more of your own strength, boy, if you did that, then what? Then you would find a spouse, you would kick the addiction, you would be healed, your kids would grow up perfect, you would lose 25 pounds, you would have a perfect marriage, your job would be richly satisfying, or even harsher, my family would never face a tragedy, there will be no accidents or cancer or divorce or financial ruin where are you still holding on to that belief that somehow you have to muster up your own strength to walk on the water and I just want to speak to us as a church body this morning too as the Bartlett's and the White Hills make their way back here from Florida Let us not demand that they muster up enough faith to walk on water during this terrible time of grief. Let's not do that to them, okay? It is time for us to be done thinking that because we are weak or because we sometimes doubt or because the waves sometimes seem too big that God is deeply disappointed in us or angry at us or holding out on us until we get ourselves together. I am here to tell you that it very well may be instead that God's hope for you and for me is that we sink. And in our desperate need, we then cry out the most powerful prayer in the universe, Lord, save me. What if the Christian life is not about our strength and power, but it's all about Christ's strength and power? You see, Peter, in all his glorious ridiculousness, tried to walk on the water, and I love him for that, but he sank And this moment was part of what made him great. Because not just in this story, but throughout the rest of his life, he learned not to sink in despair, but to sink instead further and further into the grace and the saving power of Jesus. Peter learned that his faith was not to be in his own ability to walk on the water, but his faith was to be in that Jesus who could walk on the water. And his faith was to be in that Jesus' willingness and ability to save him when he was going to drown. May that same faith be found in us. Amen. Philip Yancey said this, and I brought it on the slide. He said, there's one central symbol by which we remember Jesus, and that is the cross. And the cross offers proof that God cares about our suffering and our pain because he died of it. And this symbol stands unique among all the religions in the world. Many of them have gods, but only one has a God who cared enough to become a human and die. So as we eat the bread this morning and drink the cup, I want us to remember the cross And I want us to remember that when God the Father seemed most absent in this world, when his son was hanging on the cross, he was actually at his most powerful. And what looked like failure was actually the greatest triumph of all time, God's triumph over evil and suffering and pain and death. The cross means that death does not have the final word. 
Christianity alone, of all faiths, is based on a symbol. It's based on a reality that tells us when we suffer, when the storms rage, when we sink, we are not alone. Because this is when God is at his very best. So focus on the cross. Focus on the fact that when it seems the most hopeless, that is when the hope of God shines. And so we serve continuously here at Orchard, so the ushers will come forward with the bread, and I encourage you to hold it and meditate and take it when you feel ready, and the same with the cup. And we believe that it is Jesus that invites us to his table, the table he has set with his body and with his blood. And he says to all of us who choose to follow him, whether we're members here at Orchard or not, Come, eat and drink and remember what I have done for you. And midway through this time, Katie and Bradley, who are so brave, you guys have no idea how hard this is for the worship leaders, um, are going to sing a song that Dave had Becky Bartlett sing after his family teaching about walking through dark times. And I invite you to listen and to let the words wash over you and sing along when you get to the part that you know if you want. Remember that because of the cross, even in the storm, even in our darkest days, even when unimaginably tragic things happen on earth, Christians of all people can say, my heart is broken, but it is well with my soul. So ushers, come on forward and I'll start to pray. God, it is so easy to forget in the storm that you are the victor. And it is so easy to forget the power of your cross. And I pray that you would not let us do that this morning. We do this in remembrance of you. Amen. Still know 
waves and wind still know his name and it is well with my soul it is well with my soul